said is that I didn't know about fly fishing. And my lawyer, Skip Brittenham III, uh, took us fly fishing for the first time. And uh, I got hooked, you know, no pun intended. It, it's just, to me, one of the greatest things that you can possibly do. Uh, and then, uh, when we would fish together in the same boat, there is a rule. I was in the front, Stacy was in the back. The guy is in, and my water was from the front to the guide, and then Stacy's water was from the guide all the way in the back of the boat. Except if I thought there might be a fish in Stacy's water, my fly would find itself in her water. And I couldn't help myself. And I tried. I went to therapy. <laughs> there, are ther there are therapists just for staying in your own water. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. Uh, so we eventually uh, figured out that we would um, fish in separate boats <laughs> and meet up at lunch. <laughs> it works. Stacy catches her fish and mine are bigger. <laughs> Yes, she's a great fisher person. She is. And I am in the bottom 3% in the country academically. Uh, math was hard, science was hard, history was hard, reading was hard, spelling out of the question. I was great at lunch. <laughs> so I got a camera. I had no idea how to use it. I had never turned a knob on a camera in my life. You know, sometimes you can get a camera with an interchangeable lens, and you can turn knobs, and there are lots of minuses, and pluses, and f-stops, and apertures, and I keep it on automatic. <laughs> and I started to take photographs, and the only thing that I change is the focal length. I go in close on the subject, and I pull back, and I pull back. And then I take it home and I look at it, and sometimes I get a photograph, and sometimes I don't. One out of five children in some way has um, a problem academically. And it immediately eats away like an insidious worm at your self-confidence, at your self-image. Because you're sitting in your class, and you're thinking, wow, I, my, my pencils are sharpened, and uh, I'm really organized, and I've read the material, and somehow I've lost the material, uh, either on the stairwell, going up to my classroom, or on the street. I don't know, it fell right out of my head. So it is, so this is what I tell every child that can hear me, and I say this ad nauseum. It does not matter how you learn. It doesn't matter at what rate you learn. What you must know is that you have greatness inside you. Every one of you has a gift, and your job is to figure out what that gift is, dig it out, and give it to the world. And I want to tell you, there is not one adult in the room, in your house, in your town, in your state, in the country, who cannot wait to see who you become. The, I guess a fifth grade word is hilarious. Because I get a lot of letters saying, you are hilarious. <laughs> and, but the greatest letter I ever received, a, uh, a child wrote me and they said, I laughed so hard, my funny bone fell out of my body. <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, they write and they say, how did you know me so well? Oh, I'm not alone. Or, if they're not dyslexic and they just laugh anyway, they write and they say, you know, Henry, my dad has dyslexia also, and you're not alone either. <laughs> uh, so, yes, I was worried about being typecast. As a matter of fact, I was offered the role of Danny Zuko in Greece, uh, and might have been the one mistake that I made in my career. Because I said no, I had done the Fonz for several years, so I said no, and I went home and had a soda, and John Travolta bought a plane. <laughs> there are obstacles we all face. 
in our own way. And it seems to me, for the most part, the distance between getting where you want to go and not is your will. There was a great phrase I got in fan mail, as a matter of fact. I got a lot of fan mail. I got 50,000 letters a week. And it was so scary to leave my apartment when I was playing the fonts because people wanted my socks without ever taking off my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I got gifts. I got balls of gum wrappers. Ladies would chew gum and then take the wrapper and tie them into these daisy chains and make these balls. And the bigger the ball, the more they loved me. So there are women in America with no teeth, because that was all the while. <laughs> I got, oh, I got jewelry. I got little crucifixes and little bears. Little girls would take off their jewelry and send it through the mail. This is what I learned from my family. Jewish girls do not send their jewelry through the mail. <laughs> I think it's a wall. But I also got a metal cutting, and it said, if you will it, it is not a dream. If you will it, it is not a dream. And it was first said in 1946, and I must say, I have come to realize that that is one of the things, one of the concepts, the precepts, that makes this earth turn on its axis. Your will. The Broadway. Okay, 1973. I try out for a Broadway play. I get it. Unbelievable. We rehearse. We open. We close that night. <laughs> it was so fast. I was taking off my makeup. They were ripping it out the sink. Um, can you do your Fonzie impression? <laughs> And they love it. 
So I'm now going to try and make it my business. I will tell you that I just went to the seafood shanty and had a lobster roll. So far, that is my fishing on the cake. And let me tell you, it was good. For $89, you too can have a lobster roll. into writing children's books. A man named Alan said to me during a lull in my acting career, who knew there was a lull in an acting career? He said, why don't you write books for kids about your dyslexia? And I said, because my parents used to call me Dumont One or Two. They used to call me Dumb Dog. Very lovely people. Very supportive. And I said, I can't write a book. Two years later, he said to me, another lull. Why don't you write books for kids? And I said, oh, okay. He said, I'm going to introduce you to Linda Oliver. I said, okay. And we hatched Hank Zipser. We sold it. We had a contract for four books. And those four grew into 17. And now we have just turned into a new publisher, Scholastic, a brand new series called The Ghost with the Most. Uh, uh, and so I'm now writing with Lynn my second series of books. We have a contract for four, and maybe it will grow. You know? Oh, I am no different from you. We are exactly the same. Okay, so my jacket is in the Smithsonian. But Simon, <laughs> the greatest thing about being a celebrity, they call you up and they say, would you like to come with me to New Zealand? We'll outfit you. You can bring your son, you fish for 10 days, and we'll film you. And I said, let me think about this, I would. <laughs> At 31, I found out I wasn't stupid, I wasn't lazy, I was trying to live up to my potential, I was not a dormant, I had dyslexia. And I finally defined dyslexia for myself. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out school. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out why you cannot figure out school. And you spend a third of your time covering your shame and humiliation. The child in your classroom who is causing trouble did not wake up in the morning and say, wow, I think I'm going to be a pain in the ass today. <laughs> They know, a child knows they're not keeping up. You just know it, and it, as we said before, it eats away at your sense of self. And our job as parents, as friends, as teachers, is to make sure, no matter what, that we buoy the child so that they don't drop into the black hole of just feeling complete failure. How did I start on my acting? I wanted to be an actor. I uh, knew that I wanted to be an actor since I was seven. Uh, I went to school. I, I got into college. Uh, I applied to 28 colleges. I got into two. I got into Park University in Missouri. I have never met anybody who's actually gone to Park University in Missouri. I think it is a doorway on a prairie. I also got into Emerson College in Boston. <laughs> I took um, theater and child psychology so that if I didn't make it, maybe I could work with kids because I got along with kids pretty well. You know? And then I went to Yale Drama School. And uh, I don't know how I got into Yale, but I did. And I studied and I studied and will. And, but you have to study and you have to read. Um, I, I didn't actually read a novel until I was 31 because I was so intimidated by all of the words <coughs> in between the covers. But then I realized that you could work it out. You could figure it out. 